let's start by trying to solve some problems that involve geometric figures. In some cases, the expressions used to calculate perimeters, areas, and volumes are polynomials. We'll see how that works. Here's our first problem. A cube has sides of s feet. How much greater would the volume be if the length of each side were doubled? If the weight of the cube is directly related to the volume, and the original cube weighed 100 pounds, what is the weight of a double-sized cube? Let's look for information in here. The cube has sides of s feet, and we'd like to know how much more the volume would be if we had a cube where the sides were 2s feet, if the length of each side were doubled. If the weight is directly related to the volume, and the original cube weighed 100 pounds, what would be the weight of the double-sized cube? Let's summarize the information. Cube 1 has a length of each side s. There's the original cube. The length of each side of cube 2 is twice that, or 2s. There's our doubled cube. We know the weight of cube 1 is 100 pounds, and we're given that the volume is related directly to the weight. If uh, the volume doubles, the weight will double. If the volume triples, the weight will triple, and so forth. Let's continue our analysis. We're asked the question, what is the volume of the doubled cube compared to the volume of the first cube? And what's the weight of the doubled cube if the weight of the first cube is 100 pounds? Let's analyze this. First, we'll use the formula for the volume of the cube and the givens to find an expression for the volume of each cube. Next, we'll use the fact that the volume's directly related to the weight to find a relationship between the weights. And finally, we'll calculate the weight of the second cube knowing the weight of the first cube. For cube two, we'll start with the formula for the volume of a cube. The volume is the length times the width times the height. Next, we'll substitute values for length, width, and height. We know that each side of the large cube is 2s. So our volume is 2s times 2s times 2s, which of course is 2s cubed. When we work this out, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Remember, we take the coefficients and multiply them together. Then we uh, compact the variables. We multiply those together so that the volume of the larger cube is 8s cubed cubic feet. Let's look at cube 1. Again, we'll use the same formula for cube 1 and then substitute in the length of the sides for cube 1. When we do that and simplify, we find out that the volume is s cubed cubic feet. Reviewing that information for cube 1, we have a volume of s cubed cubic feet. For cube 2, we have a volume of 8s cubed cubic feet. We can review this, and we know the weight is directly related to the volume. And if we look at this, if you double the sides of a cube, the volume becomes eight times greater. So in going from s to 2s, we've increased the volume eight times. Let's see how the weight is going to shift. If the volume of the second cube is eight times the weight of the first cube, then the weight of the second cube is also eight times the weight of the first cube. Then, if the first cube weighed 100 pounds, the weight of the second cube is eight times more. It's 800 pounds. This is a really interesting result because what that means is as the size of something changes, its weight changes as the cube of the size. So if I, for example, weighed 200 pounds and I doubled in size, 
I would actually not weigh twice what I do, I would weigh eight times what I do, and that means that I would weigh 1,600 pounds if I were twice my height, twice my width, twice my thickness. And I don't think that my muscles would scale up quite that much, and I'm not even sure if I could move myself around if I were double my size. So next time you see a movie about incredibly big monsters, think about how incredibly strong they need to be to carry their weight around. Let's look at another problem also involving geometrical figures. What we'd like to know is what's the surface area of a box 5 inches by 7 inches by 12 inches? And this is a representation of the box. In order to get a good idea of what we mean by surface area, let me go to the table and cut a box apart for you so we can see how it gets laid out. Here's a box of diskettes that I found in my office, and I thought that would be a good one for the demonstration. And since this box hasn't been opened, it will allow me to open it. Here is, I'm just going to take this and hopefully I won't injure myself too much. I'm going to cut it here so it will open like this. Then I'm going to cut it the same way on the bottom flap so it will open like that. Then there are pieces here that I don't need that aren't in the problem. I'm going to hopefully not hurt myself too much. Get rid of that one. Get rid of that one. And you can see it's a new box of disks. Let me get rid of the disks. Then I need to open the box up this way. <laughs> and open the box. Boy, what it and finally, come on. <laughs> wow, I think I finally got it. Okay. Here's our box opened up. This was the bottom. Then this piece here was the top. But you see, if I'm looking at the surface area, I have six separate pieces. The bottom, the top, then these are two sides, and that's a piece of junk, and these are two sides. Now since, you know, and if I can put this back together, you could see the original box, and here is the box opened up. Let's keep this in mind as we look at the problem itself. We have a surface area of a box 12 inches by 7 inches by 5 inches. Let's open that box up and see what happens. We're given a rectangular box, and there are some sides we can see, the ones in the front. We know it's 7 by 5 by 12, and there are six surfaces on the box, as you saw when I opened up that real box, and we can see three of those surfaces. Let's expand that idea and actually open the box up. We know that there's a top and a bottom, so there's two number threes, there's a front and a back, there are two number ones, and there is a, a, a one side that we can see on the right, and there's another side that we can't see on the left. We can see two, but there's something opposite to two that we don't see. Let's open the box up just as I did. So here is the expanded view when I peeled the box open. I peeled three up, I peeled the bottom of the box down, and so forth. So we see we have six different surfaces, but the surfaces are in pairs. One and five are a pair, the front and the back. Three and six are a pair, the top and the bottom. Two and four are a pair, the right side and the left side. The second, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So there are six surfaces we need to deal with. Let's analyze this. The box is made up of six rectangular sides. Each has an area given by the formula that the area is the length times the width. We're given all the length and widths so that we can calculate each of those six surface areas individually. Then we add them together to get the total surface area of the box.
each side of the box is duplicated, as I said, so we're going to need to calculate three areas, and then we can multiply each of those three to get the whole one. Here's the surface area of the box, and so we're going to have six different areas. Let's look at the numbers. We know that the area is equal to the length times the width, and now we put the numbers in. 12 times 7 is going to be area 1, uh, 12 inches times 5 inches is area 2, and so forth. Now I could rearrange these a little bit to show that top and bottom we have doubled them. Then I have twice and I've calculated the area of each of the three different sides and I know that since I have two of each of those, I have to multiply by two. Then I finally do the math, and I find out that the area of all of those sides is going to be 358 square inches. We see that the algebraic expression for the surface area of a box with dimensions L length, W width, and h height. Let's try to develop the formula abstractly, and we see it's a polynomial. The area is twice height times length, that's one of the sides, height times width, that's the side on the right, length times width, that's the side for the top or bottom. Now let's change direction a little bit, so to speak and talk about solving problems where things are falling. Here's the problem. A skydiver jumps out of a plane traveling at 10,000 feet above the ground. We'd like to know how high she is, how far above the ground she is, after 10 seconds and after 25 seconds. And here's, of course, a picture of the skydiver coming down. The history or the um, basic information for falling bodies, very interesting. It was calculated originally by Galileo Galilei, and he found a way to calculate the distance of falling bodies. And here are the things he found. Ignoring air resistance, no matter what the weight of a body is, they all fall at the same rate. The reason something like a feather falls more slowly is that there's air resistance. There are experiments you can do in vacuum where you drop a feather and drop something like a marble and see they fall at exactly the same speed. We also know that as things fall, they move faster and faster and faster. That's called acceleration. They don't fall at the same rate. And we know that we can develop formulas for the distance fallen and the speed at any moment, and these formulas that we, we've developed that started with Galileo's experiments are actually polynomials. Let's take a look at the formula. We've discovered that objects fall according to this formula where d is the height above the earth in feet, and so at any time we can find out how far something has fallen. t is the time the object falls in seconds, and d o, or it's actually d sub zero if you want to get technical mathematically, let's call it d o for the original distance, and that's where we start from. The minus 16, you might ask where that comes in, that actually has to do with the interaction between gravity. If gravity, if Earth's gravity were greater, that number would be bigger. If Earth's gravity were less, things would fall more slowly, basically, and that number would be smaller. But it works out to very, very close to 16 for the Earth. We also see that there is a minus sign in front of the 16. That means that if we start out at some distance above the Earth, d0, or do, the original distance, as things fall, that t squared term is going to get bigger and bigger, meaning that you're getting closer and closer to the Earth. What you're subtracting from the original distance is going to get bigger and bigger with time. That's the background. Now let's look at how the, it will work in terms of the problem itself. 
The skydiver jumps out of a plane traveling 10,000 feet above the ground. How high is she after 10 seconds and after 25 seconds? So there is the information summarized. We're at 10,000 feet and we want to know the altitude after 10 seconds and after 25 seconds. There's the summary. We have a falling body that tells you we're going to be using that equation for falling bodies and we're starting at 10,000 feet above the ground. There's the ground. There's the plane. We're starting at 10,000 feet. There is the formula that we start with that we're going to plug some of the information into. And here's the question. How far does the person fall or how far above the ground is the person after 10 seconds? And then how far after 25 seconds? Here's the analysis. We're going to use the formula to find D at 10 seconds and 25 seconds given the original height. Pretty straightforward. Then we're going to do the same thing at 25 seconds. There's the formula. We want to first uh, find how far the person has gone at 10 seconds. So we plug the information we're given in the problem into that formula. D, the distance above the ground, is minus 16 times the quantity 10 squared plus 10,000. If I do the math, 10 squared is 100. So D is equal to minus 1,600 plus 10,000. If I do the mathematics, I find that after 10 seconds, the skydiver is at 8,400 feet. That's about a mile and a half above the ground. Let's investigate now, just for fun, how far the diver has fallen from the plane. We know that at 10 seconds, the diver is 8,400 feet above the ground. Then, if we take the original 10,000 feet the diver started at and subtract how far above the ground the diver is after 10 seconds, we found that in that 10 seconds, the diver is 1,600 feet below the plane. Now let's look at the case for 25 seconds of falling. Here's the formula. And what I've done is I've substituted 25 into t. 25 squared is 625. Then when I do the math, minus 16 times 625 is minus 10,000. I get distance equals 0. So it looks that after 25 seconds of falling without a parachute, we're right at ground level, d equals 0. So if D equals zero, that meant the, <laughs> the skydiver hit the ground. Uh. Um, I probably should have warned that skydiver, although this was a typical physics problem, perhaps it would have been good to open that parachute. Let's look at one more falling body problem. A pebble dropped from the Eiffel Tower hits the ground after eight seconds. We'd like to know how high the Eiffel Tower is looking for the information, something you drop from the Eiffel Tower, and of course we're ignoring air resistance here, hits the ground after eight seconds. How high is the Eiffel Tower? There's the ground. There's the top of the Eiffel Tower. There is the pebble that we're going to drop. We really want to work the other way now. We want to know what the original distance is. And we've dropped it. We're given that it takes eight seconds to drop. And it goes to, falls from the original distance. Now we have the equation that the distance at any time is equal to minus 16 times the time it falls squared plus the original distance. And our question is, this time, how far does it fall? Let's look at how we'd analyze it. The pebble falls a distance equal to the height of the tower. That means we can use the formula to find the original height 
after, um, after the time of eight seconds when the final distance above the ground is zero. In other words, the pebble starts at the height of the Eiffel Tower, falls eight seconds, and at the end of that eight seconds, its distance above the ground is zero because it hits the ground. That's how we'll do this. Here's the relationship we're going to use, and we're going to put eight seconds in for t squared, and remember, we're going to use zero as the distance because we want to know when the pebble hits the ground, how long, uh, what the original distance is. Here's the substitution. d, the pebble has hit the ground after eight seconds. We want to solve this for the original distance. Here's the equation. We see that we have minus 16, eight squared is 64, plus the original distance is equal to zero. If I now solve this for the original distance, I can subtract, or I would have to add, 10,024 to both sides of the equation. So I would find that the original distance is 1,024 feet above the ground. So the height of the Eiffel Tower is 1,024 feet. Let's move from falling bodies to business transactions and look at the case for profit and loss and how much you make, how much money from sales, what the cost of production is. So really, the money you make is equal to the money you get minus the money you have to spend in providing the service. Here's the problem. We have a net profit, which is how much money you've made, the revenue, which is your money that you get from sales, and the cost, which are the cost of production. Those are the three basic quantities that we're going to be working with in this problem. And we can understand that we have an equation, how much money you make has to be equal to how much you earn from selling things or selling services or selling goods minus how much it costs you to obtain or produce those goods. Here's the problem. A Pronto Lube garage charges $25 to lube any vehicle. Other work that it does, brake work and so forth, adds about $6,000 per month to the revenue. It costs Pronto Lube $8 in material to service trucks and $6 to service cars. Monthly operating expenses, things like rent, salaries, and so forth, run $23,500. We'd like expressions for the revenue, costs, and net profit for C cars, some number of cars that they process, and T trucks per month. Let's look at the information that we're given and information that we're asked for. We're given that they charge $25 to service any vehicle. Plus, they get $6,000 more a month from other things that they do. It costs more to service a truck than a car. It costs $8 to service a truck, $6 to service a car, and that includes the cost of oil and labor and so forth. The monthly operating expenses are $23,500. We like to find ways of or find equations for what I've just said, what's stated in this problem for how much they make, how much it costs, and the profit in terms of how many cars C that they process and how many trucks T that they process. There's a lot of information in this problem, so it's good to summarize it. $25 in oil change, $6,000 in additional work, $8 per truck, $6 per car, and each month they deal with C cars and T trucks. They find they have $23,500 per month in overhead. Here are the questions. What's the revenue? How much do they make? What are the costs? What does it cost them to produce the service? 
and what is the net profit? First, let's take a look at the incoming revenue. They have $25 per vehicle and C cars, T trucks, plus $6,000 in original work. They have 25, the revenue is gonna be $25 times the total number of vehicles plus the $6,000 extra they get. We know that the total number of vehicles will be the number of cars plus the number of trucks. So for the revenue, we have the following polynomial. It's 25, which is how much it, what they charge each vehicle for service, times the total number of vehicles, the cars plus the trucks, plus the $6,000 they get for the rest of what they do. Now I can use the distributive law to multiply the quantity C plus T by 25 and wind up with the final equation that the amount of money they make, the revenue, is 25 times the number of cars plus 25 times the number of trucks plus 6,000. Now let's go after the costs. What does it cost them to do business? The costs are $6 per car times the number of cars, $8 per truck times the number of trucks, plus $23,500. So the costs are 6C plus 8T plus 23,500. Now let's look for the net profit. We see that the net profit is how much you earn minus what the costs are, what you've received minus the cost. There is the first polynomial for how much money you've made, the revenue, and we subtract the cost. There's the revenue minus the cost. When we look at this, we see we have a problem that involves subtracting polynomials. Let's do that. The, we have 25. Remember, again, when you subtract polynomials, you add the opposite. So for each of the three terms in that second polynomial, in the lower one, we need to add the opposite. So the opposite of plus 6C is minus 6C, which leads us, leaves us with 19C. 25T minus 8T is 17T, and 6,000 minus 23,500 is minus 17,500. Here's a review of the things we've learned in this chapter, and it's interesting to look at the net profit because this is something that business owners actually do to figure out what they need to do, how much business they need to do to break even. And we see here that you need to cover at least $17,500 or you're going to be losing money or not making anything at all. Thank you.